Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix Online Meeting 210. This would be tax day if it was tax day in the United States, um, but it's not tax day in the United States. That's like next month. Um, as always, these meetings are recorded for those of you that aren't with us right here, right now. If you are with us right here, right now, it'd be great if you said hi. So go ahead and say hi in chat. Uh, Ron just said, I'm still here. That's awesome. We were chatting a little bit before the meeting. What are we doing today? Well, we're saying hi, and we're going to do triage, because that's uh, what we always do. And then we're going to do a V4 design discussion. And then we have an update on V4 preview zero status based off of the comments I made at the tail end of that last meeting. Uh, I think it's kind of time to make it um, official here. And then we'll take questions, comments, like always. Uh, Bob, I think the first thing we're doing is triage. Are you ready? Go for triage. Here we go. Um, I hope this is pretty straightforward because I think we opened all of these issues, <laughs> except the last one. Um, first one's Bob's thing that we've been punting down the road a few times. All right. Um, these two issues I opened as part of the work I was doing on the inline directory syntax that is not exactly inline directory syntax anymore, um, but I opened them and I left them in triage um, because the first one I want to talk about a little bit is that um, in, this has been a thing I've been staring at for a long time, and it looks particularly bad with the other decisions, or directory ref, which is the alternative. This was looking particularly bad um, when we made those other decisions that I do think were great, um, based off of Sean's feedback on how to get to introduce subdirectory, which I think did clean up a lot. But the net result was that, and I don't have code examples, but you would end up with like directory ref program files folder at the top of then potentially directories and things like that. And it looked um, wrong. And so I've wanted to solve this problem that has been talked about in the past many times, um, where people are like, I have a directory, and then I use program files folder, but that's like one of the built-in ones. So why do I have to define program files folder? And it confuses people. And also, there is no one place that you could say, hey, what are all the standard directories in the Windows installer? The language didn't help you in any of this. Um, and so the idea was, I, I used to call it well-known folder, um, but folder well-known folder is a concept in MSDN, but we don't use the word folder in our elements. So I went back to directory, and then after kicking around, I was like, yeah, we call them standard directories. We call them standard actions. We're going to call it standard directory, which essentially is a directory ref, but the ID will be an enum so that you can uh, go through the list of all the standard directories, and it should help lead people down the right path to um, or at least kick off your directory trees with a standard directory, like standard directory ID program files folder, and then the rest of the directory tree under it. So I just wanted to leave this here as a thing, um, as a heads up, because I still have to, um, before we ship preview zero, I want to go back and I need to go back and essentially rewrite the inline directory syntax spec. And I want to toss this piece into that spec um, to make things all go. Um, so yay. Uh, happy to finally have solved the well-known folder um, challenge that has popped up in Wix, for, especially for beginners, trying to figure out how do I know which ones are the ones that I can start with? Um, I just removed triage. It's otherwise correct. Um, this is a bug when I did the directory table. This is a long-standing bug. I think that somewhere in the translation, the comparison to say, hey, drop the source name, when it goes, Jacob, old syntax still works. Yes, the old syntax still works, and the converter will help get you to the new syntax. Um, anyway, so source name table, always written in the directory. Oh, yeah, so if the target and the source are identical, there's no re reason to write them both. This is a bug. I don't know why I left this for triage. Probably I just didn't remove any tags, but it was a very small bug in the translation from V3 to V4 that it got lost. All right, moving on. Again, that could just remove triage because that thing's been fixed. Um, I enumerable. Sean and I had this conversation in a pull request, a bug, a pull request? I think a pull request, um, about the extensive use of I enumerable in the world. And my, the intent of using I enumerable was essentially to say, here is a read-only view over the data. Go ahead and do this to prevent providing things like add and remove and such like that, because there's many places, especially when you get deeper into the pipeline, 
of the Wix tool set that we don't want you messing with the collections, um, particularly all the command objects we have. And so the thing I selected way back when um, was I enumerable as a thing to say, hey, give me a numerator, and then I will walk through all this. So essentially, you for each, or you can link into it. Um, and the important thing was that we're, they're not um, indexed, so you don't do index access into them because, again, we don't guarantee an order when we hand these things out, so I don't want to pretend like there's an order. So you can't say, hey, give me the zeroth one, and then come back later in the price in the pipeline and expect the zeroth one to still be the zeroth one. It probably will be in most cases, but it won't necessarily, and so we didn't want to make that contract. Um, and so uh, I think Sean said, hey, we should probably use read-only list. And I was like, I don't want read-only list because I don't want to make that guarantee about the array indexer. But then also found that everything inherits from I read-only collection, that um, including I enumerable, <laughs> I think. Um, and I read-only collection also provides a count, which actually is a nice thing to have exposed. So Sean has gone out and opened the issue that says, hey, uh, we should probably switch off of I enumerable to I read only collection, which better represents uh, the intent. It is a read only collection, not purely a generator thing that you can just loop through. Um, and I generally agree with that. The question is, when do we want to go about doing that and changing things? And I think that given that there's not a lot of um, Inside the core tool set, I'm not sure there's a lot to do in it. I think this issue is about where we expose the I enumerable, right? Like in the Kapala context. Right. So, I, yeah, all right. So I think we should definitely do this in extensibility. It should not be sent to extension. Okay, right. So this is about extensibility. And data, yeah. I don't know how many I numerals are in data. I'd have to go look. Okay. Right, symbols. Yeah, I think, I feel like that was, I fixed that when this came up as, I think that was like my test, my big test to see if I read only collection would work. And it worked. Oh, it was I list, yes. Yes. Well, so actually, yeah, that, that was actually a different problem. That was the, um, oh, no, oh, oh, no, oh, no, um, oh, no, um, uh, so, uh, so Sean has just, sorry, the oh, no is all about Sean and Bob are not audible, and that means that the options, when I set the recording to this, which means I have to find out how to do this, how to get back into the settings. All right, I'm going to have to, all right, everybody, take a breather. Give me three minutes to get Sean and Bob back connected, because it looks like they're not connected through NDI. If you want to go search for something, go search for um, NDI and Skype and what that means and I will be well I'll be with you guys on the stream right now I'm gonna kick Sean and Bob out real quick and we will come back so you guys drop out I will start this call again hopefully with the NDI turned on here we go all right so what I have to do is go into settings inside of um, Skype and turn on allow NDI usage which I thought stayed on by default um, but it doesn't look like it does and NDI is a technology that allows me to connect my Skype calls into the rest of my system and pipe it out to the pipeline to Twitch um, to all of you. So let me go ahead and kick this back up. And there's NDI this time. So hopefully we'll get these guys back online and you will be able to hear them this time. Um, I, my hope is that we can hear Bob. And the first thing he says is, are you sure? Um, so is that better, Jacob? I'll give you a second to answer here. Uh, I'm still not seeing Skype audio. Oh, wait. Yeah, okay, that looked. I'm getting you guys on the monitor now, although you're not saying anything. Can you hear me? Yay! Can you hear me? 
Yes. All right. I, I'm seeing you guys on the monitor now. I, I should have looked. I didn't look at the monitor. Yes. All right. Great. Um, I will have to make sure that Skype doesn't do that in the future. Um, what other witty things did you guys say that didn't happen? Oh, they, it's so witty. It really just can't be repeated. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I, I think I blabbered through most of this issue, and Sean pointed out that this is mostly about extensibility. That's the key point is that we need to not, if we're not going to be exposing i enumerable in the long haul, we probably shouldn't be exposing it in extensibility now, which is a very good point. Um, and then Bob pointed up that we had an, uh, what we thought was i enumerable in the immediate, but was actually i list. And so that was my first experiment in changing that to an i read only collection. And then also making sure, because the symbols on the section were a list because that's how you added to them. And where we were at was that had a scare about section IDs on symbols and what that meant as I was going through the old issue and the what ended up being a patching scenario. You can go, I think we talked about that last time. I forget. Um, I think so. Or two times ago. Um, and um, so that fix was to provide a an entry point on the intermediate to add symbols so that we could insert extra checking if we ever needed to, as opposed to exposing the collection directly off of intermediate and adding symbols everywhere. So that was that one. We've And through that experience, learned that I read only collection would uh, work extremely well in all the places we're using it. So that um, uh, was a great knowledge expander. And now I think we just need to drop that into um, the extensions as well or into the extensibility as well, since it also is a public interface. Um, and I think that's what this is. So this should probably go in 4.0. You can give it to me, and this shouldn't take too long to get fixed up and get everything built, because I'm already doing I just checked thing. data, and there's a, a handful of instances where we expose an I enumerable. There are several instances where we take an I enumerable. Yeah, taking an I enumerable different than exposing one. Yeah, so, agreed. So, yep. Okay. So let's toss us a 4 and um and I will take it to go to it. This is a straightforward thing to do. Uh, just we need to go slide into all the other work. All right. Moving on. Um, migrate compiler backend specific errors to the compiler. So this is a thing that um, we have uh, talked about in the past, um, or no, I, I meant to talk about in the past, and then CPU Wizard in the chat uh, got hit with it first in his PR with the idea of pulling more error messages out of data. The error messages that are specific to the internal workings of the Wix tool set do not need to be in data. And before, when error messages in Wix 3 were all inside the one Wix DLL, it was easier, straightforward to migrate them all out. Um, I don't think this is something that, given where we're at, that we're going to do in four to pull out more than we have. Um, but I think we should toss. I want to put this into you know Wix v next so we could track it and don't lose this fact um, going forward. And yeah, if we have time, which I just don't see happening <laughs> right now, um, we could yank out a bunch of the messages just to prevent people from accidentally taking dependencies on messages that we never really intended them taking things on. And and they're really deep, like, internal workings of the Wix tool set messages, but um, we'll be able to move them some other time. And also sort out the error numbers, probably, because the error numbers aren't real slotted real well that we need to kind of go through and think that through, too. Um, but I just want to have this out there as well. So do we have a, we don't have a post for yet, do we? Doing that now. Ah, fantastic, Bob. Thank you. Hmm? Um, insure table should be available for any MSI table. Yes, yeah, so something went here when, um, as part of the fixes for, I'm forgetting the thing that drove it underneath. Fix, oh, code pages. Fixing the code pages mess that was on um, 
And so fixing the code page mess of creating MSI databases, because code pages were on the sections, which made no sense at all. Um, we ended up combining code pages into the module, or creating a module symbol that stored all the stuff about a module, which then means we didn't need the module signature symbol anymore, which essentially is the underlying, hey, here's all the information you need about a module, but not everything you need to build the module, just enough to put, build the module signature table. Um, and so somehow in that, by removing module signature, uh, ensure table to module signature didn't work. Um, and uh, so just have to go figure this out. I don't know if this is a preview zero bug or not. I don't know that anybody should be using ensure table to module signature. Ensure table to other tables works. We have custom, we have extensions that are doing it, and that works. So I'm not sure what this one. Any opinions? It can absolutely wait. All right. So we'll put it forward. We need to make sure it works properly for all tables, including those that, for whatever reason, don't work here. But it's on. Um, Jacob asked and Sean answered uh, about the previous issue, because I guess I rolled along or too quickly, uh, about um, can we remove these error messages, or is removing these error messages a breaking change? Sean answered that you know moving stuff out of data would be a breaking change. These are kind of on the edge of nobody should be using them, so we could move it, but we probably shouldn't. Um, if we really want to move them in preview one after preview zero, or if we have time and we can clean them all up in preview zero, that's great, but I don't think we're going to. We'll look at that. So if we want to in preview one, I'd be willing if someone wanted to debate that. But, but after that, we probably just need to live with it for three, four. Uh, WISC convert does not report errors if converter file can't be written to disk. And yeah, that's just a bug. I don't know this is a preview zero. Um, files read only, it's like, yeah, don't do that, but we probably should fix it in four, right? Especially as we're gonna need this thing working properly. Yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little nervous about not doing it in preview zero because WIX convert is like the first thing you're gonna run. That is true. Um, there's an issue referencing error numbers in the test. There's no accessibility to these internal symbols. I think that's on a different thing. Um, I'm not sure what he's talking about there. All right, so you think we need to do this in preview zero? Uh, I, yeah. Uh, enough, I'll volunteer. If okay. No one else wants to. I don't know, I want to, but maybe CPU wizard wants it. That would be awesome. He's done some fixes in the converter. I'm not sure how hard this one is. Um, there'd be a preview yeah, zero bug, so it would jump to the top of our PR or PR list and be like, hey, a preview PR. We'll definitely jump on that. Non-preview zero PRs? Um, that's just going to have to wait a second. <laughs> um, all right, so let's put in preview zero. If, uh, if CPU wizard wants to do a value for it, he can. So I'm not I think try to his question it. about internal symbols is that Everything's internal and core, so the tests can't reference and something that's internal to core. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's handy sometimes because you can cast the the you know warning and error IDs, um, yeah, you know, to the you know whatever to the messages or to the uh, exit code. Where that doesn't work, I just you know use that symbol and then comment it out and replace it with the number. Yeah. Um, yeah, something to think about if we do that a lot too. I, I, I just, again, I'm not sure that's going to be a 4.0 thing. It'll be something we'll tackle in 5. Um, package description, package ID does not resolve. Uh, some delayed binder thing not working. Um, and Sean's been kind enough to submit a uh, repo for it, so that's good. Um, probably preview zero. These things should probably be working in preview zero. I don't want to take more bugs in preview zero, but are they completely broken? It's not getting replaced. Sorry, I meant I meant are all of, there, there's a huge number of them. I didn't test it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that some bind variables are working. Yeah, yeah. right. Exactly. Sorry, I, that's they're used in 
Oh yeah, no. Some some of them are working. Yeah. Um, like the ones in MSI, I'm pretty sure are working because I know there's extensions that use them. Right, right. Um, I don't know if there's anything that uses the bundle one, so it's like the bundle one doesn't work. It's like, oh, okay. Um, yeah, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I I just don't. I'm a, like, no more preview zero bugs, but that's just. <laughs> Um, that's why I'm looking for other people to say, uh, yeah, I probably should fix that in preview zero, or, yeah, I can wait. Probably should fix it in preview All zero. Right. All right. All right. Um, you're, you're looking for a volunteer. Now, I'm not volunteering to fix the bug. No, 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 give it to me. I no, would it, I would volunteer to, you know, make more work for you. No, no, no. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there's yeah. enough there to reproduce the problem I will be able to go into. And I have, as we'll see, there's a few other Preview zero bugs that are still like in that land. So it's like, yeah, just drop in, fix six six, and move on. Um, someone made the uh, very true section. I wish true suggestion that hey, we should have support for modifying JSON files. I agree. Then he said we should go take someone else's code and put it in Wix, and that was like, I don't agree. Um, especially since they use Apache, uh, we use uh, MSRL, so there's a language or a, a language uh, a license difference there that would need to be solved, and so. They need to, um, uh, those people, if they wanted to contribute to the Wix toolset, hey, we could have that conversation. They would go to CLA, then they would change the license, and that would all be them choosing to do that. And yeah, we could have that conversation, but not us just going out and stealing it. Or, you know, someone could just implement it in Wix, and that would be awesome too. Also, there's nothing wrong with third party stuff out there and that's true kinda, too like they could just hang out there and they yeah. could do that so um i kind of agree with him that json is going to get important so it might not be a thing that should stay third party for a long time but sure. uh you know it's like yeah uh who's doing that work um as you can see we're a little busy so uh not it on that front all right i think we're done with triage yes yep, yep. all right so let's go back to our design discussions I picked two. Um, these are both Sean's um, because I don't remember resolving them. And he may be like, I already decided what to do on that. And I know we need to talk about the second one. So, uh, Sean, do we need to talk about rollback XE package on cancel? Uh, I'm not working on that right now. You want so to talk about the don't... lower number first? Yeah, I'd rather talk about the lower one. All right. So the lower one is burn when use incorrect payload if local. This has been a long-standing thing um, in burn. It's just a bad design decision. I don't think there's anything in the issue. Is there? No. All right. So Sean sent this email to Wix. That looks like this. If you want, you can read it while we talk. But I'm going to let Sean summarize it, and then we'll go from there. I don't know. So if I think we've tension. already. Agreed on the API changes for the on the during acquire, like in v3, it would try to probe for a local file, and if it found a local file, then it wouldn't even let the BA participate in choosing which source to use to acquire the payload. And so, that was the the design flaw, deep deep design flaw, very bad. Yeah, that's that's the design flaw. So. Now we're changing it to where for every payload, the BA is going to get on cache, acquire, begin, and complete. Because in V3, it only got those messages when it actually would go and acquire something instead of having the local file already available. So on those on cache, acquire, begin, and complete, those are the two places that the BA is going to be able to set the source for the payload or any payload really. And then, so instead of on the on resolve source event, that's where V3 would have, uh, the BA would have set the source. The BA now has to do it on beginner complete. And then in addition to this, uh, in between beginner complete, the engine will make a callback. It's like on cache acquire resolving. It'll say, here's all the paths that I look for locally. Here's the download URL. Here's the container. And 
just like in V3, the engine's going to prefer local files and then extracting from the container and then downloading it. And then the BA will have the decision to override which one of those three actions to take. And due to our technical limitations, they can't set the source today in that resolving event, but they can wait until on cache acquire complete. If that fails, then that is the new place for the BA to prompt the user for source. So did we all, have we agreed on that part of it? Yeah, I think that's fine. Yep. Okay. I think that experience is going to be fine. And most people can resolve, ignore the resolving if they want, because they can't do anything but acknowledge that that's going to happen. No, they can change the source out of the list, right? So right. theoretically, they could look at one of those sources, and they right. could copy a file to one of those, and then it could say, yeah, use the, that path. But, but it could also say, hey, you found it local, but I want you to download it. Right. I, yeah. Do I remember that? It yeah. That, that. that It could do that too. Right. That one. Yeah. So then another part of this is just going to be just enhancing the overall cache experience by providing more progress during caching and trying to make it to where the cache progress like makes sense because today V3 was pretty confusing. I tried to make it better in V4 years ago, and it's still weird. <laughs> so what I'm trying to do is get, like for every payload, because we're always acquiring it now, it's not like steps are getting randomly skipped. Because in V3, there was like a skip and still retry or something like that, to where there was a lot of events that would try to not happen if the cache was already there. So trying to match those up with the progress events made it very hard to give meaningful progress to where the numbers that the BA was getting was making sense, especially during if the BA wanted to retry a package. So what I'm trying to do is make it better. <laughs> so there's missing progress events right now. So in V3, the only progress the BA would have gotten was if actually acquiring the payload. And then it would have received like 100% right before it tried to verify the payload. So it was getting on cache acquire progress inside of on cache acquire or on cache verify. So it was a little, the messages weren't lining up. So basically, the on cache acquire progress is only going to happen between begin and complete. And then I'm going to add um, on, ca on cache verify progress is going to happen in between the on cache verify begin and complete. And then I've changed it a little from when I sent the email because I've been working on it yesterday and today. And I'm probably just going to have one on cache verify progress. And then inside of there, it'll say, all right, I'm copying the file from the working path to the unverified path. That's what I called staging. And then there will be the verify hash step will be another progress step. And then the last step will be copying the file from the unverified path to the final path in the package cache. And then, so that's one thing. And then another thing is, in V3, during detect, it would, during detect, it would look at the file in the package cache and check the file size. And if the file size matched, then that's where during the plan, it would have skipped the acquire and tried to just verify it in place. So in V4, it's gonna work differently to where when it gets to that payload during caching, the first thing it's going to do is going to try to go look in the cache and verify the file that's there. So that's this on cache payload um, or container verify progress and complete. This is like the, trying to do the fast path of, is it already in the cache? And, um, 
and then the last one is the extracting the container. Uh, there was no progress at all during extracting the container. So what I'm doing is yeah, it was really bad. trying to do one event for every payload. So on cache payload, extract, begin, progress, and complete. So that's the plan. I'm not um, sure how the naming is going to work, or I don't know. Some of the names are maybe not great, <laughs> but I think the overall design should work out. Yeah, I think that's, it certainly sounds better. I think the only question is, well, I guess you're basically adding progress for every possible transition to um, mitigate or to go the opposite where there's pieces missing in V3. Because like moving the file from the unverified path to the cache path, the final resting location, is is literally just a move operation, right? Um, oh no, there's a verify. Wait, no. It verifies it and then it just moves it, right? It's been a long time since I looked at the code. There is a I'm trying to remember. So I think you're correct that the unverified, well, what happens is it copies it from the working path to the unverified. Yep. That can be a copy. That is not necessarily a move. Right, yes. After that, it verifies the file in the unverified yep. location. Yep. And then the last thing is, I guess that always would be a move from the yep. unverified. It should because it sh it shouldn't be switching volumes at that point. It should have the unverified should have been on the same volume as the cache path. So, yeah, I could. I I it's just like the progress between there is always going to be, hopefully near immediate. I I I brought up offline that during layout it's different because there's no unverified path. So during yeah, layout, cause they, right? Because there's no ver there's no yeah, there's no unverified path because there's no trusted location. So, I mean, each of these moves are essentially moving to a higher level of trust of the binary. So we move from working directory where it can be modified by a user to the unverified path where it can't be modified by a user, but we don't know if it's good to, then it moves to the cache path when we know that it was good and it couldn't be modified by a user. That's essentially what it's walking up this levels of trust of the particular file, making sure that a a file that could have been modified by the user or hasn't been verified to be the exact correct file never ends up in a place where we might use it to do an install with it. That's the goal of all these moves. And we always guarantee that the unverified location is trusted. Right. It's all locked down the same way the package cache is. It's just we put okay. stuff in that location that we don't know if it's good yet. But we have to put it in that location because users can't write to it while we're checking right. it. It all comes down to the inability to be able to no hold a file perfectly and validate it and then put it into another location perfectly every time without having user modify it. Yep. So during layout, there's basically no staging. Right. So so the, and there's no trust layout. boundary, right? Because we're not, we don't trust the files anymore. We, we download them, we verify them for you know, integrity, but it's not a trust relationship. It's a, well, I don't know, you told me to put this stuff in this folder, here's your DVD. You know, I won't install it on your machine, I just put it right here. So it doesn't have that same trust requirement to hop through. Well, it's, uh, I want to come back to the trust, but um, the what I was trying to get to is that there's no staging during layout, but there is the finalize. So during layout, it would acquire to a working path, mm -hmm. would verify it, in the working path, and then it would have to copy it to the final location. Yep. So in that instance, the finalized step could be a copy and not a move. Right. Totally makes sense. Because the working no, folder the trusted... could be on temp, and you could be putting it onto your, you know, your Z drive or whatever. And yeah. For the trusted part, the the layout will use the elevated engine if the bundle is elevated. So it could be laying out to a secure location, uh, with, but the unverified path would not be, the working path would not be trusted. A secure.
secure location. Well, so it, it could be right. It could be copying files to an elevated location, but it doesn't trust them there. If you then do an install from that location, it's still going to go through the process of copying to unverified, verifying it, then putting it in the package cache. It doesn't trust the. It it makes no trust statements during layout. I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, but you could lay out to the package cache. <laughs> You if could. It correctly. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're an admin, you can go through and install a virus directly. So absolutely. <laughs> and, and actually laying out to a to the package cache would be challenging because we don't the layout is for the burn image, not not in the package cache format. So that's good. And also you right. deserve every problem that you run into. Yeah, I mean just right. So I agree with that. And I I don't know why I don't. I think we decided to use the elevated engine because we had people trying to lay out to a, a trusted location or a, a locked an admin location, and people wanted that just to work, right? They wanted to be able to use the UI and burn and lay it out. And if the user was elevated, well, then put it in the folder they said to put it in. Don't fail because they don't have admin privileges. Because they do have admin privileges, and it was that kind of experience of a, all right, fine, put it in the folder you said to put it in. You are an admin. Don't overwrite important things. Well, what you're saying there um, could have happened without using the elevated engine. So the only way to make the cache, the layout, use the elevated engine is to have a custom BA that explicitly elevated before doing layout. Okay. So is there is there a real reason to keep that feature? I well, even if sorry, I'm I'm confused. Even if the BA were to elevate, does do the layout operations happen in the elevated engine? So if the BA has not if the bundle has not elevated, then the engine will never try to elevate during layout, so right. it will not use the elevated engine. Okay. But if the bundle has elevated and it connected to the elevated engine, then it will definitely use uh, the see. elevated engine to lay out everything. What if, but if you just start a bundle elevated, I, does that cause the creation of the elevated process? It does not. Sorry. But, the, but it, uh, the pre cleaning room process would be elevated, but it would still be the BA process that is typically unelevated. So you're right. Um, after clean room, there there is no. It's just the elevated process that controls this. It, whether or not the BA process is elevated has no bearing on whether yeah. layout uses the elevated engine. Okay, and I, and I think clean room probably messed up some of this stuff. I mean, but certainly. before clean room, the I'm pretty sure that if the bundle was started elevated, it would have started the second process for the BA process, and then the original process would have been an elevated engine. I mean, it's been a long time since I've looked at that, but yeah, I, I'm not too worried about it. it, it the scenario is just is I, I started this thing elevated. I should be able to write to elevated locations. And we don't make any trust statements about the layout, right? It's just the here we have downloaded and this is integrity. But if someone um, wants to come in and modify your files while we're doing all this stuff, they can do that. We're not, you know, if you have some malicious software or whatever, we're not making any trust guarantees about the layout folder. But we won't install from that folder. We won't install directly from that folder. We'll go through our process of copying everything. So, well, is that one reason to run a layout elevated? Is to ensure that you are writing to, if you are writing to a secure location, an unelevated bit of malware can't touch it. I mean, <laughs> really, re, it's I'm, I'm it's I'm completely reaching here. I yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's. It, it, it's not a it, it's not a terribly interesting scenario I mean in the end I mean can we just never use the elevated engine during layout 
That would make things simpler. Yeah, I don't know why we are using the elevated engine during layout purposefully. Right? It could have just been the way it ended up more than anything. The scenario I was talking about was more if I started elevated, we shouldn't have done anything to prevent that working. I don't know that we need to say, hey, let the UI push the elevate button and then do a layout. It's kind of odd. Yeah, so it would. I can write a lot less elevation code if we remove that feature. I'd be fine with that because the workaround is to start the bundle elevated. To write to an elevated location. Yeah. Yeah. The idea of having an elevate button in the in a custom BA is kind of well the technical term is funky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um so anyway, so overall I, I think it's fine. There's just I'm I was trying to get in my head all of the callbacks I'm going to get for progress now um, in normal cases. And I just, um, um, and then in this, oh, in the initial implementation, all the new progress events will be sent with only once with 100% if the event was successful. Uh, the new ones, I see. So because because you're not going to send progress during verifying the file hash, for example. Yeah, we don't have code. The functions we're calling today don't take a progress routine. Got it. Um, so essentially you're saying, hey, I'm starting this process. Hey, look, I finished that process. Hey, I'm starting this process. Hey, look, I finished this process of transferring from working to unverified, starting the verify of the file in the unverified location, and then moving the payload to the cache path. And that lasts, so all those are essentially start 100%, start 100% as fast as the burn engine gets through them, right? Yeah, I've actually, so I did change the design a little, like, this morning. <laughs> of, I'm not going to create three separate begin complete events. Okay. For the, are, you, are you sending an enum instead, or are you just going to? So I'm going to keep on cache verify begin and on cache verify complete. For that's that four that's in this list? That that's exists in three today. So that's like an overall begin complete. Okay. So that's between three and five. So base all of that then. Yeah. Okay. And then yeah. there and then on cache verify progress will be sent for each of those. And yes, there will be an enum in there saying we're staging, we're verifying the hash, we're finalizing. I, I mean, most people aren't going to deal with that stuff. The only thing that's interesting is if you have a very large file and you're copying, this can take a little bit and the verifying can take a little while. Hopefully this is like near zero time. Hopefully the move operations are, hey, look, the file system says it's in a new directory. We're done. Yeah, so during cache, five will be very fast. During layout, it will not. Necessarily. Oh, because five replaces three. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I think combining them is fine. Because um, you're not going to get a lot of information. There's not a lot you can do with that, right? Where this, you're like, hey, we're downloading from the internet. Where here, we're doing local disk operations. And those are just completely different speeds, generally. Or sorry, you may be downloading from the internet, right? Or whatever. You're copying from the DVD. Please wait for the signing media spins. Does anybody do that anymore? Well, what is this DVD you speak of? <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, I didn't say floppy. Um, okay. Wow. Talk about showing ages. I just had to go back, man. <laughs> you know, big five and a quarter thing. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway. Um, yeah. You could have so... gone to CDs first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. there was a bit of a... That's a generational gap there. No, I just wanted to go straight to where Sean wasn't comfortable anymore. Um, <laughs> he's like, I don't know what they're talking about. What does it look like? <laughs> I'm not that young. I know, I'm joking. I had floppies. Uh, paper tape punch cards. Yeah, the, the Windows installer doesn't support paper tape or punch cards, so that's why I didn't go there. The Windows installer does, in fact, support three and a quarter floppies. I don't think it was ever tested with five and a quarter. Um, but it definitely was tested with three and a quarter because that's how Office was going to ship originally. Way back when in 1990, 
well, it was designed in four, shipped in 99. So anyway, um, yeah, so I think the only thing I was thinking about was actually the same thing you did, which was, it seemed like a lot of events for not a lot of detail. I totally think that combining these makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I see that, that this sounds great. So on the progress messages, are they, is, is it an overall percentage or does the percentage increase for each of the, the stages? Uh, so I'm going to use the file size for the payload. So mm. during um, during caching, the it'll be like the overall bytes that the engine is tracking will be five times the file size or four, one for acquiring, one for staging, one for verifying, one for um, okay. finalizing. So yeah, it'll, each stage will be like, you know, zero bytes, how many, ever many bytes out of the fi file size for the payload. Okay. And then cool. at each stage, it'll commit that to the the one, total. The one tricky thing about that is that in most cases, this speed here is way different like if you're downloading is way different from these two and the copying is generally well I, I it used to be depending on what kind of hard drive you have the copying if it's a copy is faster than the verify but that may even be changing now um yeah there's going to be at least some cpu writing. time involved yeah, but plus yeah. plus the uh, the same amount of I/O is copying. Yeah, and this actually has writes in it now, so I I only worry about grouping all these in one. Only providing one percentage for all of them. If if this is the overall percentage, that's something. But I mean, if you imagine a progress bar with one file, it's going to go really slow during relatively slow during acquisition, uh, pretty faster in transfer, pretty faster in verify, and then immediate for that last one. And so that progress bar is going to not going to be at all scaled to where it, what happens there. Well, oh no, inaccurate progress bar. That's yeah. never I happened mean, before. V three gave no progress for three through five. Right. With the hope that that was generally fast enough to not be a huge thing, which isn't always. At all true, but um, so I guess that's what I'm saying is like suddenly these three are going to show up. Your progress bar is going to your behavior, progress bar behavior is going to be very interesting. Yeah, but but this is per file, right? Yeah, per file, per, oh, per, payload, per file, per payload. Yeah, and then overall, I mean, still overall, you know, honestly, it's fine because it's going to. And also, like step four, verify is pretty much the only meaningful progress that's going to be showing during one. If the file's already in the cache, then all the progress is going to be done during the verify right. hash. Right. I'm, I'm just thinking, if it's a process. two gigabyte file, and this and this is essentially zero to two gigabytes in one click, that progress is very goofy, like potentially worse than usual. That's all. Right. So you're like two gigabytes of work, <laughs> very fast. Two gigabytes of work, of read work, and then super fast. So you, your power supply is going to go one fourth slow, halfway very immediate than that next quarter. It's basically the quarters are going to go through very fast. Uh, it's just something to think about if we always base it off the size of the file. Hmm. Well, the, the part, the hard part of not using the site of the file is how we're doing progress today, where we're taking the overall bytes cached already, and then we're adding the incremental on top. So what will happen is if we try to scale down the finalized step, the five, if we try to say oh, only 20% of the size, then what's going to happen is if that's like all the progress, then the overall is going to be two gigabyte. The progress so far is going to be you know, well, under my algorithm, it would be overall would be 10 gigabytes. But if you scale down the last step, then it'll have a committed thing of eight gig. And then as it's going through the transfer, it's going to go over that original 10 gig that it planned 
or original. Yeah, so it, but you also can't tell. If you're doing a lot of downloading, though, it's pretty typical to, to scale that separately, or sorry, show that separately, like in a separate progress bar. Yeah. Yeah, so today it's the overall progress is in percentage, but the file progress is number of bytes transferred out of number of bytes total. Well, all of them, two, three, four, all, yeah, one through five are going to show just the file size as the total. It's the same BA event, but it's going to be yeah, a different enum each time. Yeah. Cool. Um, if we're going to do another thing, I'd rather do the cache condition stuff. Uh, five, one, two, five, I think. Uh, I guess I should give you a link to the Wixdevs email. I sent it. We. We had like a whole meeting discussion on this one, and then I was trying to figure out how to allow the authoring. Yeah, that one. Yeah. So if you remember last time we discussed renaming no yes always to remove keep force and I was keep I kept on pushing back against trying to combine it into one thing and where this comes into a problem is ideally you would allow the authoring this kind of thing to where if the bundle author wants to have a variable to specify whether all to use remove like give the user the option whether they want to have everything stay in the cache or not. Then if you want to have a variable to control that, you need to have a condition in the authoring. And then you can't have one condition that lets them pick remove 
or force, you know, all conditions are Boolean. So they have to choose one thing or another and that doesn't work well with the tri-state remove keep force that we have. Okay, I'm gonna reject the premise of your question though. I don't, I don't think this is something that, that needs to be offerable. This is, this is the, the, the balance we have between the flexibility of an imperative BA versus a declarative bit of bundle authoring. Um, and we're already, we already have differences. Obviously a BA can do way more than, than you can author. Um, and you know, so to an extent we have to, we have to, you know, weigh the costs of making something authorable versus just saying, well, a BA can do it. Um, and this is one of those where I'm not, I'm not seeing a huge amount of value in being able to author um, the the level of caching, I'm just not I'm not sure that it's something that, uh, given that you know until Wix three nine, you you know it was yes no. I'm not sure that that we need that additional flexibility at the authoring level. A BA can always take care of this, right? A BA can decide. And to an extent, I'm willing to say that this is, some, this is something that, you know, should stay in the BA realm. Right. Well, no one has asked to have the ability to remove packages to have remove configurable by the BA either. Right. Unless you already happen to have one. And also, like, kind of a long term goal for me is. It'd be nice to be able to specify, like, let the engine run on autopilot when at running as a related bundle. So, like, so that way you don't have to, you can specify that your BA just wants the engine to run silently, like when it's being uninstalled as an upgrade, for example. And then you don't have to worry about writing your BA to be able to run silently. Oh, uh, I see. Kind of, it's almost like BA list. Yeah. So it's like I've authored the bundle how I want it to work. I trust the engine to make all the right decisions. Yeah, we haven't got there yet. <laughs> I, I well, I, I get it. it. This I is get more it. about the separation between business logic and and uh, business logic slash UI and um, bundle behavior. BAs have all of that in one, yeah. and and yeah. separating them out is sometimes hard. Yeah, now this is this is a decision in the first version of Burn just to make it possible. Right. Right. 
Like, it was just like, all right, the engine's going to stop here, and you will be able to do everything that you need to be able to do. That was the goal. Yeah. Um, and, um, hmm. So I, I, I like what you're saying, Sean. I, the, I, I like the aspiration. I think we're not there yet. Um, I don't think we've, I don't think we've made a lot of decisions to make that happen yet. Um, I think that's a big like, shift from where we're at right now. I guess the first thing shift is in the previous one where the caching, the engine will try to, will um. If there's a download URL and there's no local file, then it will default to the action of downloading, which is a change from v, v3. Yeah, that, that one, I, I, I see what you're saying there, but that one is more of a, um, given the twists and turns that caching went through and the, the, this goal that, I don't remember where it came from of being able to have everything prompt um, before it went for a download, like that was a purposeful decision and it was, it's really kind of nonsensical in this world. Um, but it was really important back then with like, you know, you're, you're, there's times where people are still talking, are some people still on modems? Right. Um, so it was just, it was just different um, there. Um, the BA having to request it is kind of silly, I think. Yeah. And, and, and I, URL, it should, you know, just yeah. magically work. Right. And yeah. And I don't def that you, I, you don't see me defending that decision right. deeply, right? Right. right? I'm just like, yeah, that happened, but that shouldn't. I, I guess I'm saying that shouldn't inform the 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 aspirations of burn. <laughs> like that was not an aspirational. It's like, oh yes, this is definitely the way to do things. Um, but the idea that the at the same time, right? You can change your download. The fact you couldn't get a, if the local file was present and you couldn't overwrite it, that was bad, for example. That's an example where the BA could not change the behavior. That was bad. Um, so the um, instead so in, so I like the idea of the silent the headless BA. I, I kind of like that idea because silent is already word we use. Um, I like the idea of a headless bundle and being able to get to there, I think we need to do a lot. Because we're going to have to figure out how to do that plus letting the BA override and make sure that, that works correctly across the board. Um, at the same time, I'm not ag yeah, against the the conditions, more conditions, different conditions. Um, like I wasn't against repair condition when someone asked for it. I was like, eh, okay, I can kind of see why you want to do that. Um, but try states and conditions are not fun because you end up with two conditions that have to be like mutually exclusive or an order that they're evaluated and an answer has come to and things like that. It's just harder to implement them. Well, you, with the repair condition, it's going to be the same order problem if there's install condition, repair condition, mend yes. condition. Yes, I and I, I agree. It's going to be weird, but at least with a repair condition, um, you can say, uh, if, well, if it doesn't repair, if it's not repair, don't repair it. Um, here, I, get, I don't, what would we do? There would be remove from force. So there would be the, a condition for removing it from the cache and a condition for putting it in the cache no matter what. Right, so this is back to my original argument of, I don't really like it being a tri-state in the beginning. I would rather have an always cache, uh, yes, no, and keep in cache, yes, no. And then you get the, the nonsensical fourth state there, right? The always cache and don't keep in cache. The yes to always cache and the no to keep in cache. That state just doesn't make sense. It's like Which here, we cached the, it and uh, then we removed it. Compile error. <laughs> Except the BA can do it. And then you can't change it at runtime or rather a runtime. There's, there's no runtime syntax error. 
Yeah. What would it do? Fail? It, well, no. It would, well, I, I mean, mean cache it, it and then I brought it? this up last time, but there's uh, there's already non cyclical things that the BA can request in events. True. We're already ignoring things that the BA is requesting. So I'm not sure that happens with something that's authorable. Because again, authorable doesn't generally have as much power. Yeah, so I, I'm not big on tri states that. anyway. So this is the I love tri states, and that's an excellent example of a tri state. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, I guess if we're going with Bob's rejection of the premise, that, that really makes this easy with nothing to do. But otherwise, yeah, this isn't, doesn't seem like we have a clear direction to go here. Well, that's why I would stick with, you yeah, no change. Because um, I, I am, uh, truthfully, caching should just happen. I don't think it should be authorable. So like repair condition, as I was reviewing Rob's pull request, I mean, I, I originally implemented repair condition. Um, and I'll but then on when, I was, when I was reviewing Rob's pull request, um, it, it occurred to me, oh God, wait, because he added the mend state or well, state. Um, which I'd also done at a separate time from repair condition. And then it occurred to me, oh, wait, does that mean we need mend condition as well? And, you know, this is, to me, this is pulling up the, the, the great annoyance I have with the major upgrade element. Something else that I did way back in 3.5, 3.0, I forget. Um, the major upgrade element was supposed to be an easy way to author typical simple major upgrades. It had three or four attributes at the time. That was it. It now has like eight. I was responsible for one of the extras, but the rest came from people going, oh yeah, but you know, we should be able to blah, blah, blah. And so now major upgrade element is maybe more confusing than using the old school upgrade and upgrade version element. No. <laughs> okay, fine. Probably not. It's still not that bad. But um, it's it's gone from, you know, a very straightforward thing. You know, one or two attributes is gets you what you typically want um, to now having to navigate a bunch of mutually exclusive potential values. So in general, I'm in favor of of you know reducing the power of authoring the whole repair condition men condition thing i'm like no let's not do that that's just not a it's not a good idea um if you need that level of control of of overriding overriding burn overriding the engine a ba is the place to do it then we can come back and solve the problem of how do you make you know bas easier to write blah 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 Sorry, that's a long-winded way of me saying, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to give caching that much power. I think it has too much, as it is. I don't think we should have exposed cache at all and left it to the BA. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking the repair condition goes away on the same line? Yeah. Yeah. And we never think about men's condition. Yeah. Well, that's easy. Yeah. Also, yeah, it's easy. So that's could have said an additional yeah, bonus. Block of porting work, but that's okay. It wasn't. A, a... <laughs> yeah, it, remi it reminded me a lot of things that I'd forgotten about Burns. So that was nice. Um, yeah, that's good. I mean, you're right. This, that would definitely be the easy way to go for us. 
I don't know. I haven't heard a lot of wanting to change this. Like there was the request for always. That's why we added it. That's why it's added as a yes, no, always. And that funky, usually when you see a yes, no and something else, it's usually because we tacked it on later. Right. Hence uh, why remove, keep, and force are just maybe the best words ever. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But let's let's go here for now. And let's go with remove, keep, force for now. And we'll revisit again next time, essentially, because I think we just kind of need to find our way to how much is authorable, um, how much isn't. Um, if we don't bring back repair condition, mend condition, well, then that's just, yeah, we're not doing a lot of those things. And then let's also do so in the, in the eye of the, and here is the headless bundle scenario. Um, that ties these things together because the headless bundle could force us back into making more things authorable. Um, but it might not. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd very much like to explore that area um, because I think, there, again, this is the, the difference between between the user between the user experience um, and and the lower level bundle stuff. Um, and and business logic is mixed in on both both sides of that. Yeah. So let's go with this and and let's think about how we want to let me let me put it this way. I think that's the next thing for burn is something along the lines of headless and more authorable or whatever we decide there. It's like finding that line. It's probably the next thing for burn. Yeah. Right. On a big front. Yeah. I think it'd be interesting to look at, at moving, moving some of this, some of this, uh, the higher level stuff that's supported in authoring into extensions that mm -hmm. you know we could if we had this we could have we, we could have something like a headless ba right that still supported extension that supported yeah. these extensions sure. um but but didn't have you know like all of Wix standard ba ui included yeah so being able to do you know a ba by layers like that would be really interesting uh, yeah because i mean it really sean's fixing a lot of the worst problems of burn in D3, from what I'm seeing. Yeah. yeah. And so that's going to be like, all right, here's V2 of Burn. It's better than V1, because Burn in V3 was the first one. So it's it's better than it was in V1. We, we fixed a lot of things that we know are problems. Now it's time for us to go, what's the next for the V3 version of Burn? Which is so confusing. The, the third release of Burn um, let's say, all right, now we've taken what we've learned and we got it stable, it's working well, let's imagine what it could be beyond what it is now. And we might just need to go get a bit more information about how people are using it. Because I think really the, the big things are going to be gone. So I think that's probably where we're at right now with it. We just don't know. And we should go find out when we think about the next big thing for burn. It's kind of like when Wix 3 came about, extensions were the big thing in Wix 3. And we've again refined that extension model in V4. So Wix 5 will probably have a next set of bigger things. Um, and that seems about right. I feel like that's what we're doing. We're adopting a TikTok model, I can tell. It's kind of that way. I don't, I don't know yeah. that it was intentional. It's just kind of working out that way. It's taking a while to survey the, uh, the landscape and be like, ah, okay, this is where we go next. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking of, of the architectural changes from, from V2 to V3 that enabled extensions. 
for example. Yeah, exactly. And and the underlying extensibility model in V4 enables yeah the next thing. I think it fixes a lot of the things that we didn't get right in that first one because we didn't. Also know. true. Like yes. like the back end, the whole back end was a nightmarish yeah. world of extension. Like it's just terrible. The design of that was horrible because we slapped it all in, not knowing how to do it, because we spent most of the time trying to figure out how to get the compiler right. 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 And I feel much better about V4. The pipeline in it, it's I'm not sure it's perfect, um, just given the way it's the timing is hit, but it's definitely way better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so all right, I think that's where we're I think that's kind of what we're hitting. Um and we have to go figure out what the right next thing is. Like, hey, that repair condition, is that not is that it in or out? What are we thinking? The changing the caching declaratively, is that an in or out thing? Where is that line of things at the headless BA that can just burn can just take care of it for you. Um, is there an issue on the remove keep force thing? It's part of five one two five. Five one two five. So, you know, you you can see the Bob uh, said it could be like for repair. So we're kind of yeah. It's kind of two things in here. Okay. It's the remove keep force, but we're also changing the behavior of keep to where it'll cache more often. So if you remember, the problem is, is that if the package is already installed, when you're installing your bundle, sometimes your bundle wants to make sure the package is cached. And it wants to cache it if it's not already cached. Yep. Even though the package is already installed. Yep. So that's like the behavior change. That's what the issue was asking for. And then yep. as part of that, we were deciding to change the names. Is the option to cache packages that aren't needed for install, is that in or is that after preview zero? That's not in yet. Right. And it's not going to be. So the, the, the preview zero was just getting rid of yes, no, always, so that the language was ready for whatever the changes to burn were next, right? Right. Yep. OK. Um, all right. I'm going to put that over here in my little notepad of reminders for the day. I mean, it doesn't, we can separate it out. It really is two separate things. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll decide if I need another issue or if I'll just reference this one and not close it. All right, all right, that's reminding me. Okay, I think that's enough design stuff. But I am trying to get 3640 in preview one. Yes, but I, I hope that we've answered that one today. Yeah, right. Okay. And I don't know if I'm going to do 5950. Probably after preview zero, because it's not in preview zero, right? 5950? Zero? Yeah, 5950. Yeah, that All can right. wait. Yep. Okay. I'm not going to bring this up for a little bit. All right. Let's talk about preview zero, because that's all we were really thinking about right now. Uh, Wix for preview zero, a uh, quick reminder it's the Wix.x distributor is a .NET tool. That tool can build MSIs, MSMs, and bundles. The extensions in that list, as I remembered it, were UIUtil and NetFX. Uh, you guys correct me if I got that wrong. Ball. Oh, and right, ball, right. Of course, I will fix that. Not right now. Um, and then uh, the V3 to V4 uh, source code conversion is working. Um, I'm going to have to write this down or I will forget about the ball wix extension. All right, and then um, specifically, I'm calling out that MS build support is not in preview zero, and and patches are not. They're they're kind of there, but they're not really there in preview zero. Um, those are things that will come in preview one. Essentially, are the definition of preview one. When we have those things done, then we will be like, all right, cool. It is purely bug fixes. Um, so I, I put a line in the sand last week um, at May fourth. Um, I didn't get laughed out of the room 
I got I got laughed at my hesitancy for doing so, but I I still I'm still putting this hopeful date May 4th unless Sean says no way that's not happening or Bob says that he can't get to his things. Um I'm still waiting to see what happens with the repo reorg. Um yeah. So that's <laughs> We'll talk about that in a minute. And so then that says May 4th, that says we have another Wix meeting before then, which would be the 29th, not to get ahead of the meeting, like we usually do, but the um, 29th will then um, allow us to say, hey, are we on target for the next few days of the weekend and the next few days being May 4th being the following Tuesday. Ah, uh, you've caught on, Ron, you caught on. All right, so let's go ahead and take a moment and review the issues that are in this. Now, Bob, I don't know, have you tagged things 4.0 preview zero already? Is this list going to grow? It did grow. Yes. You're welcome. No, thank, yes, thank you. This is what I wanted to see. All right, here we go. Bringing up the Normally list. you don't want to see the growing list, but okay. I don't want to see the list grow, but I want to see it accurate at this point in time. I was worried that we were going to get to this thing and we wouldn't have it. It wouldn't be mostly accurate of what the work is. So there's one change that's not on here, which is the language change for 5125. Um, but we're back in double digits. Arr, um, is Jacob still here? I have a feeling we probably lost Jacob. I should have started with this at the very beginning. Uh, well, let's see. Maybe Jacob's still chilling in the background. Um, so we've talked about these top three, one, two, three. Ah, oh, good. Jacob's still here. Great. We will, we, unless he's going to try to run away, we'll get to that point. All right. So we talked about these top three bef today, and the download URL placeholders was one we talked about before that snuck up on me. Thank you, Sean. Um, and um, so these are mostly me, and then we'll see about the whisk convert if someone if Bob gets it or maybe keep thinking maybe Ron will jump on it. We'll see. Um, so these four up here, I hopefully are straightforward. Would that be variables in the URL? No, that would be during um, binding Jacob, the download URL in the authorings, the, the percent zero and such that you can put in there are not being replaced right now. It's just a bug in the back end. Um, Sean's been great about giving uh, reproducing issues when he hits them. So it's very short for me to usually drop it and go, ah, that's exactly what's happening. I can see it. I can fix it. Great. All right. So these I'm hoping are relatively straightforward. They're just like bugs near the bottom. Um, all right. Ron says he's going to help out. That's great. So Bob, you might be off the hook for that one. Um, all right. So those are bugs. They're usually straightforward bug level things, not terribly challenging kind of things. Sign all the things has been a lot of work. Um, I knew it would be a lot of work. I knew it wouldn't be fun work, but I am I am almost done with this, I think. I am testing it um, now to validate that it works in all the scenarios. Um, one thing I'm going to point out on this after thinking about it for a while, I've decided that um, to avoid um, hidden problems, long-term hidden problems, um, the default will be everything that can be signed will be signed. Now, there are a few things in the WIS tool set that cannot be signed, um, like uh, the burn engine cannot be signed because it needs to be signed by the end user, not by us. And also the SFXCA for managed custom actions cannot be signed. It, just like burn, is modified by the user and has to be signed by them. So, um, you need to opt out of signing things. I bring this up because after much thought, I just want to make clear, like, the default is it's going to sign everything that it can think of signing, and you have to say, don't sign it. Um, that also includes test code. Fortunately, signing test code is just a waste of time, not a bad thing. The, the alternative is if we don't sign everything, then we might forget to say this should be signed. And the list of things that needs to be signed is way longer than the things that should not, cannot be signed. So I figured it was safer to just sign everything. Um, I don't expect this is going to be a big problem for most people because we're not introducing lots of new binaries and things like that in the world. But if you introduce a binary that should not be signed, um, be aware that it will be signed by default. Um, so that's a 
the big um, process thing that I've been working on that I've been dreading, and here we are finally getting it done. Um, all right, next thing is uh, Wix 4 show documentation. This is just Bob and I. This is two parts. One, Bob and I finishing the, the glue code to get this into the website. Bob's done a lot of the work. I need to kind of go jump in and help finish some of the, the build stuff to get the sites to glue together because the way that we're doing it today in V3 is uh, terrible. Um, yes. So making it better in V4 is the goal here. I think we're set up properly to do that. The second thing is a um, scrub of the entire XSD. Um, I know I'm going to be doing that and anybody else that wants to come help um, in after these other things, that would be very welcome. My part of it, I'm kind of letting that be second is because I want to make it easy to publish this. So if there are bugs in the documentation in the XSD, we'll be able to fix them and publish them and just be like there. It's just, we fixed the documentation, we fixed it. Instead of this process we had before, it was really hard to get fixes and rolls out. You had to roll out the whole entire process. Now it should be much more straightforward. Of, all right, we just need to add more documentation, fix what's said, things like that. But there will be a big pass of that. Um, more towards the end, we'll probably be like, I'm hope like the last thing that I'm just doing is like, hey, here's another fix, here's another fix, push the web, here's another fix, push the web, here's another fix, push the web, um, kind of thing to get the XSDs all set up before we're there. Um, Bob, extensions should version their IDs. I just have to go through and make sure that all of the extensions have their prefixes. Um, I'm sure that some do not yet. Yeah, um, I, I fixed I've gone HTTP through many. Recently. Yeah, uh, no. so. so Jacob, real quick, are you doing this in preview zero, allow access to persisted variables, or are we punting this to four, or I don't know, if, is it additive? I don't know if it's additive. Just, we just need to know, Jacob, if this is, because otherwise I think we're just going to punt it to post four. This is one of those changes that would change how we, we persist. The variables, right? Yeah, but that's internal, so I don't know if anything outside cares. Yeah, and I don't. I mm. think it's additive. Yeah. But it, but it's permanent. Like, if there's a mistake, we can't really change it. So. Uh, we could fix it in four preview one two. If we if if it's a bad enough mistake, we'll fix it before next meeting. All right, to be clear, the next meeting is the 29th, which means there are one, two, there are, <laughs> there's one day after that <laughs> <laughs> to kind of go, and here it is, all ready to go. We probably should have been looking at it before then, um, assuming that it's not a small trivial change, which I don't know that it's going to be. So, um, but if it's additive, then we could probably leave it four zero and if there's a bad enough bug, we'll just fix it. We'll have to just fix yeah. it. Yeah, so. that's reasonable. I mean, there are still previews, right? Yeah. The goal is we're to get not... as much as up. We're not going to be, if we're not perfect, I'm not going to, you know, cry too much about it. Um, Good thing. Yeah. It's not I don't want to. All right. So, Jacob, let us know where you end up with that. All right, cool. So we'll look for a preview. I'm going to leave it for a preview zero. We'll discuss it. Hopefully the PR is before that, because if it's coming that day, it's going to have to be pretty much perfect to make the preview zero at that point, um, assuming we stay on target. If we slip, then eh, you might get the extra uh, whatever week or whatever we slip to bring it in. Should, should, we, just, should we just move it to preview one preemptively? Sean, do you have any preferences? I don't have a preference. Jacob I mean, if he gets it in in two weeks, then we can take it. But... Yeah, let's just leave it here. It doesn't okay. hurt us to keep it open for one more, um, one more uh, meeting round. So another two weeks, basically. Um, cool. All right. So going up real quick, the NuGet package. This is just a placeholder that, when I resolve it, that means that we have published to um, to NuGet.org. Dun dun dun. Uh, this is like the last thing that will get resolved because it requires pushing to to nuget.org to, to close it. So that's kind of my last one to hold on to. Um, the repo organization, um, I took a pass at it. Um, hit a, 
I won't say unexpected because I was expected unexpected things, which is why I was doing a bunch of tests to see what the experience was. And having multiple builds against the mono repo, um, the segmented mono repo had um, didn't work out as well as I'd hoped. You end up with lots of you have to keep track of a lot more information to know whether it's good or bad any given PR. Um, so I've been kicking this around for a while, trying to figure out a different way. And I'm, I have not done enough experimentation, but as soon as I finish the signing thing, um, I am going to uh, look at it. It is the, um, is to try to create a single build for the entire repo for for pull requests. So for the you know, pull requests, continuous integration type things, be able to build the world. I'm a little worried about the speed of that if every commit ends up having to build the whole world, but we'll see um, how that works if I can get it going. And then teach the official build, uh, have another build that does not build the world, but then can build the um, build everything using locked down um, versions of NuGet packages. For example, the goal is that data and extensibility being interfaces to the core of the tool set, those would get locked down and not change under, except for under extremely um, serious scenarios. And so they'll be able to stay locked. So when we publish, we will be able to build everything against them. So PR builds will be able to build and verify if anything gets broken in the entire space, but then the official release will um, get. So there's a little bit of a space in there that we could break, uh, break, could have committed changes that would break because we haven't published the interfaces that we only find during the unofficial, the official build, the final official build. Um, and that's, I just kind of get to the point where that may be okay. That may be the least painful because it'll be like, yeah, we knew that we, you know, changed data. So we have to make it publish that it caught, told us that. So let's go get an official build of data out, then make the change of core and so on and so forth. So I'm, I haven't done that experimentation yet because I'm wanting to get the sign tools stuff done. Um, because the sign tool stuff is required for Preview Zero, where the repo reorganization, technically speaking, doesn't have to be done in Preview Zero, but it certainly would be easier if it was so we can reference all the code back. So I'm getting the signing things done, then I'm going back and I'm going to try the repo, I'm going to fix these bugs. So I'm going to get the signing thing done, I'm going to fix my bugs, and I'm going to come back to repo reorganization with the idea of being able to build PRs with a single full build so you can verify everything from end to end to see if any changes needed to get broke anywhere, anything got broken anywhere in the whole pipeline, and then figure out if the official build can be, um, which is the release build is where then we can do the interface validation and only publish the things where the um, code has changed and needs to be updated. And I'm going to see how expensive that is. So that's my next experiment to try on the repo re reorganization since the, the simple way, what I hoped to have been the simple way through didn't work out as well I'd hoped. So that's the status of that. This is essentially the last thing I'm doing or the thing I'm doing on the side while I'm getting all these other things completed because these must be completed before Preview Zero, at least the things that are on my list. All right, so that's the status of four. And if you're like, wow, that seems like a fair bit to do in two weeks, uh, you're not wrong. Um, the hope is that most of these things up here go fast and we're going to get a little help from Ron, I'm hoping that works out. And then, um, then yeah, that'll be it. So hopefully the end of this week, everything up here, or most of everything up here is taken care of. And that just leaves us, you know, kicking the documentation around and stuff like that. So hopefully that all goes according to plan. So that we hit May 4th. And if we miss, We'll miss and we'll discuss it. And we have the next meeting, as I mentioned before, to see, hey, how are we doing? How's everything in? Are we good to go for May 4th? So work to be done. If you have something you want in Preview Zero, we probably should have talked about it already, but let's talk about it very soon. And we will be wrapping up in two weeks. All right, that's Preview Zero status. Um, hopeful and a little 
you know, anxious. I want to try to get this. I want this thing done when we get it on. So that's the hope. Other things people want to talk about. Stuff going on. Going in. Going around. Nope. Going once. Going twice. Quiet. All right. Two weeks, as I've mentioned three or four times now. We'll be back on the 29th of April, same time, same place, doing um, this, although I don't think we're going to have any design review. I think we'll be talking instead about the status of everything in preview zero, not about anything that's not in preview zero, and we will be discussing whether we're on, on target to try to get released that week after. If you're not excited, you might start getting a little excited because I am, I'm just tempered with the fact that I have again, the most issues to solve. <laughs> so on that note, I'm out of here. Um, we'll be back in two weeks, and uh, we'll do this again. Until then, you guys take it easy. Bye. Bye. Bye.